soon, um, but there are still quite a lot of people streaming in. So let me give this a couple minutes. Halima, maybe you should let me know when. Uh... Good. I'll start a little bit slowly. Uh, my name is Bill Bialik. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Let me remind you of uh, the structure, um, which is that our interaction, or rather your interaction with me, uh, is limited to the Q&A. So please um, ask questions uh, in the Q&A as they come up. I'll try to pause with some frequency and rest them. I've got them sitting uh, in front of me um, so they catch my eye. Um, and our topic for today is uh, doing statistical mechanics for, for biological systems. And I want to emphasize that the, the strategy that we're going to take is to try and do statistical mechanics directly uh, on real biological systems. So um, there's a long tradition of trying to build models and uh, simplified models for, for different biological systems and inject ideas from statistical mechanics in ways that I'll talk about in a moment. Um, and what I think has changed dramatically not able to approach um, these very complex systems by um, sort of looking directly at um, the experimental data. And to give you a sort of a, a kind of visual uh, anchor for this, on the left here, you see um, flocks of birds, or a flock of birds. Um, these are European starlings um, engaged in an evening display over the piazza, which is in front of the main train station in Rome uh, in perhaps February. or March, our um, data, which are collected by my colleagues, Andrea Cavagna and Gardina and their, and their group in Rome. On the right, um, you see an image of neural activity in the hippocampus of a mouse of order a thousand individual neurons that are in one, in one layer in the brain. And, um, and we'll see more about how you, how you actually measure these things and how you uh, turn them into data that you can analyze. So um, these, are, uh, these are sort of, uh, well, in one case, literally flashing images. Um, and we need to think a little more carefully about uh, what, what the questions are. So the reason that approaches from statistical mechanics are so relevant to thinking about biological systems is that many of the things that we uh, notice and admire about the function of biological systems are things that emerge from interactions and among a very large number of component parts. So at the smallest scale, even the structure of a single protein molecule, proteins are big molecules. They're composed of 100 or more, often more than 100 individual amino acids. And so the structure that these proteins adopt, which ultimately determines what their function will be in the cell, emerges from the interaction among those hundreds of components, the individual amino acids. Similarly, if you think about what happens to a cell in a developing embryo or even in a fully developed organism, why is that cell doing its particular job as opposed to the job of some other cell? What's different about a cell in your brain and a cell in your liver? The answer is that that fate of the cell and the state of the cell emerges from interaction among a large number of different elements that are turning different genes on and off and turning each of, each of those elements is itself encoded in gene. And so they're turning each other on and off. So you have this complicated regulatory network and out of that emerges the state of a cell. This is you know, a pyramidal neuron in the brain that's going to carry out some particular function. If you think about the things that are happening as you listen to me talk, uh, as you look at images, your ability to uh, perceive things, your ability to recall a memory, your ability to plan your motor actions as you move your arm from one place to another or as you speak. Again, this is not something that happens because single neurons in your brain are doing something. It happens because thousands or even millions of neurons are cooperating in some patterned way 
And so again, the phenomena are emergent. And finally, you have the sort of very macroscopic behaviors like the example of the flocking birds, but you've also seen schools of fish, swarms of insects and so on, where the behavior that you see with your naked eye is something that emerges from interactions among large numbers of organisms. And it's important to remember that um, emergent behaviors are something that are all around us. Um, actually, I have an example in front of me. Um, it's a glass of water with ice cubes. Um, so as you all know, the, the molecules in the water and in the ice cubes are the same, um, H2O, uh, but their behaviors are different. In particular, if I put my pencil in the water, then as I move the pencil, it moves through the water. Whereas if I touch the ice cube, of course, what distinguishes it as being solid is that if I push on one end, the other end, the whole thing moves. Um, and you should, it's, this is actually quite surprising. Um, uh, when, when you take a solid and you push on it, you're only pushing on the atoms or molecules that are at the surface that you touch. And yet, if you think about uh, an object which is a few centimeters across, that means that there's hundreds of millions of individual atoms from one side to the other. And even though you're only pushing on one side, the other side moves. So somehow the information that a force is being applied is transmitted from one atom to the next a hundred million times. So this would be maybe some of you played as kids the game of telephone where you whisper something to your neighbor and whisper who whispers something to their neighbor and so on. And you all know that the reason this game is amusing is because by the time you get to the end of a chain of perhaps 20 people, the message is completely garbled. So now imagine that you took the entire population of the United States, which is a few hundred million people, and you lined them up, and you told one of them something and asked them to pass that information along. Well, you could be pretty sure that it wouldn't make it to the end. And yet, in a solid, that's exactly what happens. You, you push on an atom at one end of the solid, and an atom 100 million, a, 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 an atom which is 100 million atoms away, actually moves. So, this, this, and of course that doesn't, if you then take the solid and warm it up so that it melts, which is what's happening to the ice cube in my glass at the moment, then that goes away and you get a liquid which does not have this property. So by changing the absolute temperature by a few degrees, you can shift from one kind of behavior to another, but that's only true if you're looking at a very large number of atoms or molecules. It doesn't make sense to talk about a drop of 10 or 12 atoms as being solid or liquid, because in some sense, you can always push your finger through that drop. Um, whereas as things become larger, you get this emergence of qualitatively new behaviors like being solid or liquid. And as I think most of you know from your physics courses, if we're near equilibrium, near thermal equilibrium, statistical mechanics gives us a very precise language um, for describing these emergent phenomena. And, um, and and it's a, it's a precise language and it's a quantitative language in the, that we can make quantitative predictions about the behaviors of real materials. And often we can succeed in making successful quantitative predictions, even though we're using relatively simplified models to describe them, which is somehow tantalizing, right? So, and, and importantly, we understand why those simple models work. It's not just that we got lucky. So you might ask, if you look at a flock of birds or you look at those complicated patterns of neurons in the brain turning on and off, is there something emergent or collective? And it seems like there is. And could we use something like statistical mechanics to describe what's going on? And actually, this is a very old idea. So there are models for the behavior of neural networks that reach back well, there's landmark papers in the early 1980s, and there are actually important precursors of these ideas that come 20 years before that. And if you, uh, if you look carefully, you can see the path that leads from those ideas about statistical mechanics approaches to neural networks all the way up to the deep networks that you see today in modern artificial intelligence that are really revolutionizing how we as humans interact with machines. Um, 
But one of the problems, and the same is true if you think about um, the behavior of a flock of birds or a school of fish, and there are many, many other examples in genetic networks and development and so on. What's been challenging about some of those models is that they often make simplifications so early that it's hard to recognize or hard to make a mapping between the things that you talk about in the model and the things that actually appear um, when you do measurements on real biological systems. And it's not clear in that situation whether you should take these models seriously as real theories of the real system in the way that in statistical mechanics we have theories of real materials or whether it's just a metaphor that, that you know, uh, you should think that the ability of all the birds in a flock to agree on flying in the same direction is something like all of the spins in a magnet agreeing to point in the same direction and give you, give you a macroscopic magnetization so that it can stick to your refrigerator. Is that, is that a metaphor? Is it an analogy? Is it something that you could really turn into a theory in which you could calculate things? With the magnet, we know how to calculate things. And the question is, with the flock of birds, would we know how to calculate that? So there's lots of different approaches. And what I want to remind you of is that in statistical mechanics, at least when we're close to equilibrium, um, the, the first step, in some sense, is to write down the probability distribution for all of the microscopic states of the system. And this is the Boltzmann distribution, right? So when you write down that the probability of the system being in a particular state is e to the minus the energy of that state divided by kt, you're writing a description for the probability of finding all of the component parts in any particular microscopic configuration. And so what we'd like to do is to figure out how to do that in the context of a biological system. And so what I'm going to try and do is to switch um, from uh, doing this uh, with slides to doing it on, on sort of Blackboard, um, and we'll see how well this works. So hopefully um, you can actually uh, see what I write, and um, we'll, we'll find out in just a moment. So as a reminder, if I want to write down the probability distribution for the positions and velocities of a bunch of atoms, that's e to the minus 1 over kt times the energy as a function of all those positions and velocities. And if, I, if instead of writing a little squiggle, I want to write an equal sign, I put a constant out in front, which is called the partition function. And I hope that this is familiar um, from a statistical mechanics or a physical chemistry course. Now, when I think about, so this, this is for a system at equilibrium. Now, clearly, there's no notion of a flock of birds being at equilibrium or a network of neurons being at equilibrium. So this can't be the right answer. On the other hand, the spirit of what we're trying to do is right. You're writing the probability distribution. You'd like to write the probability, for example, for the velocities of all the birds in a flock, or the probability distribution for all the states of the neurons in a network. So if you think that neurons are either on or off, which is sort of the impression you've got by watching the lights flash on and off, and we'll talk about this more carefully in a moment, you could say, well, at each moment in time, every neuron is either on or off. So let's be a little bit more precise about this. We could define something like sigma i of t, which is one if the neuron is on, or let's call it active, and zero if it's off or inactive, silent, And what we would like to do is to write, to, to be more precise about this, we would like to write the probability distribution not for, we'd like to write the probability distribution not for what one neuron is doing 
not for what two neurons are doing, but what for what all of the neurons are doing at any one moment. And I'll write that as the probability distribution of the whole set. And um, what I think you realize is that this is a very, in principle, as with the case of telling me about the telling me about the probability distribution of the positions and velocities of all the atoms in this glass of water, um, this is a very complicated object, right? Because if I have n neurons, and each of them can be 0 or 1, on or off, then the whole network has, in principle, 2 to the n possible states, right? Because every state is composed out of 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, da, 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 and there are n of them, right? And since there is two choices for every, the state of every neuron, there are two to the n choices for all of the neurons together. So why is this, um, why is it important to remember this? Well, um, let me remind you that if you have only 10 neurons, then two to the n is roughly a thousand. So that means that if you have a little tiny network with only 10 neurons in it, that already has a thousand states. And if n is 20, then 2 to the n is a million. And by the time n is 100, 2 to the n um, is 10 to the 30th. So that means that a relatively small network of neurons in the brain has a literally astronomical number of states. In fact, if you get to 300 neurons, the number of possible states is larger than the number of elementary particles in the universe. So it's kind of beyond astronomical. So that means, importantly, that you can't, in any sense, measure the probability distribution. Right? If I want to tell you the probability distribution, I have to tell you what is the probability for every single one of those 10 to the 30th states. So it's a list of 10 to the 30th numbers. There's no experiment you're going to do that's going to measure 10 to the 30th numbers. So how, how do we proceed? How is it that we don't get stuck in this problem, for example, when we're trying to do statistical mechanics? Well, when we try to do statistical mechanics, Boltzmann tells you, so in equilibrium, What Boltzmann tells you is that the probability just depends on the energy of the system in some units which are related to the temperature. So that's a huge simplification. Where does this simplification come from? Well, it comes from the fact that in equilibrium, right, you'll remember that because that the second law of thermodynamics says that the entropy of the world is always increasing. And the only way that that can stop is if it comes to its maximum possible value. So what characterizes the equilibrium state is that it's a state that has maximum entropy. With some constraints. And the simplest one is that the constraint is just that I tell you what is the average energy of the system. And if I ask you to tell me what is, so the thing you need to remember is that the entropy that appears in thermodynamics is also a quantity that you can define for the probability distributions that you look at. So um, you remember that entropy has a thermodynamic meaning, which is related to heat flows. But it also can be thought of as a property of a probability distribution. And the thing that we call entropy, we usually write as S. And it's minus the sum over all the possible states. Actually, let me call it um, 
let me be a little more careful here. Um, it's minus the sum over all the possible states. Let me stick to this same notation. Of the probability times the log of the probability. And it's also true, this entropy, which came from thermodynamics, has these multiple meanings, which is, I think, one of the um, so sort of one of the things in, in physics that I find most fascinating is that this same quantity appears in so many different contexts. So there's the entropy, which is the thing that keeps track of heat flows, right? You write that dS is the heat flow divided by the temperature. And that's the thing. That entropy is a function of state, and it's always increasing. And so this is the connection to thermodynamics. Then we learn from Boltzmann and Gibbs that you can think about the probability distribution over all the microscopic states of the system. And this gives you uh, a way of computing the entropy in terms of that probability distribution. And then in the middle of the 20th century, we learn from Shannon that, that the entropy also tells you something about the information content of a system. So if I ask you, to look at the gas in this room and, um, and tell me, um, ah, sorry, um, somebody already asked. Uh, so this is a reference to this equation here is a reference to something you might have seen in the thermodynamics course. Um, Q is the heat flow. So, or DQ is the heat flow. So, um, you maybe remember from thermodynamics that that um, that uh, as you're watching heat flow in and out of a system, if you try to integrate all of the changes and talk about the heat content of a piece of matter, that doesn't work. Whereas if you take the heat, little differential heat flows in and out of the system and always divide by the temperature at the time when the heat is flowing, then that quantity can be integrated up to give you a function of the state of the system, and that's the entropy. So entropy first appears in thermodynamics as a kind of bookkeeping device to keep track of heat flows. And I hope that answers um, Lou's question. So, so there's the entropy which emerges from thinking about heat flows. That's the first one. There's the entropy that emerges when you think about probability distributions, there is an entropy that emerges from trying to ask, how much information do you gain? If I ask you, if I give you the gas in this room or the molecules in that glass of water, and, I, and you ask me, what is the microscopic state? Tell me the positions and velocities of all of the molecules. And you have the intuition that if I give you the answer to that question, you're gaining information about the system. So how do I attach a number to that gain in information? And it turns out that in 1948, Shannon proved the theorem, which is that the only way of attaching a number to that notion of gaining information that's consistent with some very simple requirements is to actually compute the entropy of the probability distribution. And then the other, thing you can ask is how much space does it take to write down the information? So if I want to actually type the states of all the atoms and molecules, the um, then it's going to take a certain amount of space on my hard disk in order to in order to care in order to hold that information. And if I want to measure that inf if I want to measure that space more precisely, I want to know what's the minimum amount of space that you need. The answer is again the entropy. And astonishingly, these are all the same quantity. And in principle, they are answers to totally independent questions, but they are in fact all the same. And I think that's one of the sort of deeper examples of the kind of universal 
um, character of, of arguments in physics. Um, so uh, it's not true that every, um, so uh, questions are starting to accumulate. So it's important that in this discussion, you do not assume that every microstate has the same probability. In fact, in the Boltzmann distribution, they don't, right? The microstates of the universe all have the same probability, but the microstates of the system that you're looking at actually don't because they're exchanging energy with a bath that's around you. This is a very basic statistical mechanics. Um, so uh, you, you, don't, um, uh, you don't, in fact, assume that all of the, um, that all of the states have the same um, probability. And we've already answered the thing that these are, in principle, independent. The entropy arises as answers to independent questions. But it turns out that it's always the same answer, which is kind of mysterious. And um, I think that's a very fundamental fact about uh, the sort of mathematical structure of physics. Um, but I, you know, it's it's a fact that I think um, is properly quite surprising. Um, this doesn't really have anything to do with quantum mechanics. And now the question is about the principle of maximizing the entropy. So. When a system comes to thermodynamic equilibrium, because of the second law of thermodynamics that tells you that the entropy is always increasing, you know that equilibrium is a state where the entropy is as large as possible. But because we know that you can also think about entropy as the available information, right here, there's another way of thinking about what it means to maximize the entropy. And that is that you're trying to build a description of the system in which you put in as little information as possible. So remember, entropy is the information which is available to you if I told you what the microscopic state was. So since I haven't told you the microscopic state, if I make a probability distribution which has a very large entropy, that means that it has many, many microscopic states available to it. And by maximizing the entropy, I'm putting in as little information as possible. So What's happening here, ah, sorry, um, I'm going to have to um, interrupt my screen sharing for a moment. Um, here, hopefully this comes back. Yeah. Um, good. So when I maximize the entropy, what I'm doing is I'm maximizing the available information which means that I'm minimizing the information that I put in to, this, to my description. So in some sense, if I say that P is a maximum entropy probability distribution, it has as little structure as possible. And what does it mean to say as little structure as possible? Well, you should maximize the entropy and you should have that this should be subject to some constraints. So as we talked about, if I ask you to maximize the entropy, which we know is the sum of P times the logarithm of P, and you fix the average energy, which is the sum of some function E multiplied by P, then the answer is that the probability distribution is proportional to E to the minus beta times the energy, where the energy is the, the function that you were um, constraining. And then this generalizes so that if I say that I have some function of the state of the system. And I want it to be true that if I compute the average of that function in the probability distribution P, it should be equal to the average that you see when you do an experiment. And, you, and I tell you that that's true, and I ask you, well, what, what should you choose for P? 
The answer is, well, you don't know, because there's infinitely many probability distributions that would satisfy this condition. But you could say then, let's maximize the entropy. And the reason for doing that is not because I think I'm in thermodynamic equilibrium. In fact, the function f doesn't have anything to do with energy. There's no heat, nothing. But the reason I'm maximizing the entropy is because I'm trying to build a probability distribution which um, has as little structure as possible. So in some sense, the states of the system are as random as they can be, except that I know this fact about from experiment. And if you'd solve that problem, the answer is that the probability distribution is proportional to e to the minus some constant times the function f. And if instead of giving you one function, I give you two functions, and I say that for the first function, the expectation value over the distribution should be equal to the one in the experiment. And that's true also for the second function. And in fact, you can do it for many of them. Then the answer is that the probability distribution over all the states should be proportional to an exponential of minus the sum of all these functions with coefficients lambda. And as I think you talked about in, in the discussion this morning, the um, coefficients lambda have to be chosen so that these expectation values come out right. Okay. So this is the idea where if now I can measure these properties, oops, sorry, um, if I can measure these properties of some particular biological system, I can use my measurements to try and build up an approximation to what the probability distribution over the whole system looks like. So that's the idea. And there are now some questions have um, accumulated. So let's uh, see what we've got here. Um, what's the relation between the information and the entropy? Well, so there's the entropy that arises in thermodynamics. There's the entropy that arises in statistical mechanics. And it is perhaps surprising that those turn out to be the same thing. And then in information theory, you ask, how do I attach a number to my intuition that I'm gaining information when I hear the answer to a question? So if I ask you something and you tell me the answer, I can imagine that there were many possible answers. Each answer has some probability. For example, if I ask you what the temperature is going to be at noon tomorrow, then because it's July and we're in a particular place, there's some distribution of possible answers that's plausible. And if I want to attach a number to how much information I'm gaining by hearing the answer of what the actual temperature is, then the only way to do that, that, that makes sense in light of a certain set of postulates, right, which are pretty innocuous. Like if I tell you, if I ask you a question that has two parts that are independent of each other, then the information from the two parts should add up. Things like that, okay, I'm not gonna do the whole derivation. Um, then the only thing that satisfies those conditions is to actually compute the entropy of the probability distribution. So again, it's a separate question that we can ask that turns out to have the same answer. So I'm hoping that that um, helped you with that. Um, so, in understanding that maximizing the entropy means we're putting the fewest assumptions into the model, does that mean that it corresponds to thermodynamic equilibrium? No, it doesn't. Because remember that you always maximize the entropy with respect to some constraints. And if the only constraint is the average energy of the system, then you are, and energy has the meaning that it does in mechanics, then you are describing a system that's coming to thermal equilibrium. But if on the other hand, your, um, describe your, your set of constraints is something else, then the thing you're describing has nothing whatsoever to do with thermodynamic equilibrium. In particular, um, if you had a hope, as an example, if you had a homogeneous system and you said that on average, the energy density in the right half was equal to one and the energy density in the left half was equal to two, then that can't be in thermal equilibrium. But you can construct the maximum entropy distribution that's consistent with those, with those expectation values. Um, 
uh, why are cells formed direction minimizing the entropy? Um, I don't think um, we know that cells um, minimize entropy. So um, there are certain situations in which it makes sense to talk about um, maximizing information, um, but that's a separate uh, that's a separate that's a separate discussion. So let me um, let me leave that aside. Um, and then the question is, does the principle of maximizing information, is that something you can derive or is it purely empirical? That, um, that's, a complicated, that's a complicated question. In certain situations, you can derive that the entropy will be maximized. If you give me a dynamics that underlie, if you, if you describe the dynamics. So an important point here is that we're not trying to describe dynamics. We're trying to describe the probability of what you'll see at a single moment in time. And so we're, tr and we're trying to approximate that probability distribution. We're not discussing how you get there or how the system gets from one state to the next. So in certain situations, you can derive that, that, um, that, that the dynamics of the system will lead to maximizing the entropy, um, but that's not the problem that we're gonna talk about here. Um, so let me uh, leave that. And are there situations in which the maximum entropy distribution is a bad choice? Um, let me emphasize that, um, that when you maximize the information, maximize the entropy, it's always subject to some constraints. So what's always possible is that you made a bad choice of the constraints. So there's something in the system that is important that you haven't kept track of. So remember that the, the intuition here is that you should choose a set of constraints, you should choose a set of constraints that capture what you think is important about the behavior of the system. And you might be wrong in your choice. And then your model wouldn't work. Um, so I hope that does that. Those are books that I can, as biologists, read up on these topics. So I hope that um, when we post the lecture, when we post the slides and everything, um, we'll add uh, some extra references. Um, so I hope that will help. Uh, and um, can you use this in order to determine the stochastic part of a Langevin equation? Um, uh, indirectly, yes, but that's uh, that. This, that's a slightly more technical question um, than I would like to do right now. Um, so there is this idea that um, that somehow you can take the principle, and in fact, the idea of building models, which are maximum entropy models, is something that um, uh, that is um, that that sort of arose in in the wake of information theory. So this is happening in the 1950s um, and diffused outward into many different fields. And so some people took a very serious philosophical view of that, that that was somehow very fundamental. I don't think you need to take that view in order to do what we're going to do today. So let me let me leave that aside. Um, I gave the example of things on the two sides of a box being different from each other and saying that's an example of being out of equilibrium. What I meant was that if the things on the two sides of the box are different on average, then you're certainly out of equilibrium. So if they happen to be out different from each other at this moment, of course, it could just be a fluctuation. Um, but if they're different on average, then you know um, that you're not in equilibrium. So let me now ask, how do you use these ideas to think about a real biological system? And so let's go back to the example of the flock. And this image now shows you the flock. And I hope you can see that there are, that um, where in the photograph, there are lots of little birds in the, um, in the little inset, um, there are little arrows. And um, what those arrows are is that it's been possible, uh, and this is really, there's a whole, beautiful subject here of uh, taking images of the, um, of the flock and, um, and reconstructing the positions and velocities of all of the sometimes many thousands of birds in the flock from those images. And so these arrows are in fact um, those velocities. And um, so now the question is, suppose I wanted to write down a probability distribution for all of these velocities. What do I think is actually important? If I want to use the maximum entropy idea, you remember that we have to pick some set of constraints. So what constraints should I use? Well, 
our intuition is that birds flock not by looking at a bird all the way on the other side of the flock, but by looking to their neighbors. So if that's right, then what you want to measure is the correlation of individual birds with their neighbors. So what I've shown you here is a way of doing that. If you take the vector velocity of each individual bird and compare it with birds in the neighborhood, you take the square of the difference, you average over a neighborhood of you know, 10 or 15 birds or something like that, and then you can then average over all the birds in the flock. That's what the angular brackets mean. And then you, since this has units, you can decide what units to use. And so you get a dimensionless quantity, which measures how similar you are to your neighbors. Now you'll notice that if you take all the velocities and increase them by a constant, this doesn't change because you're equally similar to your neighbors. So you should probably also constrain the average velocity of the birds in the flock. You'll also notice that um, since this only measures differences, it doesn't really tell you whether the individual bird likes to try and keep its velocity close to its mean or not, right? So the, the, the value of Q is telling you how similar birds are to their neighbors. But you can imagine that every bird also knows, ah, I'm supposed to fly at um, you know, three meters per second, so I should try and hold to that velocity. And so you might want to measure the variance of the, um, of the velocity around that mean. So this is a relatively simple theory. It says that the distribution of velocities of the birds in the flock, and remember, this is the joint distribution. So this is a probability distribution for the velocities of thousands of birds it has the maximum possible entropy consistent with how similar birds are to their neighbors, what the variance of the velocities are, and what the mean velocity is. And if you think about it, the mean velocity is just a matter of choosing units. So you're really only characterizing two things. One is how similar are birds to their neighbors, and the other is how much variance do they have around their mean velocity. And, uh, okay, so, um, what happened? Sorry, uh, every once in a while I find, ah, there we are, good. So if you follow the construction that I gave you last time, where I, at, at the end of the notes, where I said if I constrain many quantities, then the maximum entropy distribution is just an exponential with each of those quantities in the exponential with some constant out in front of them, then what you find is that the probability distribution has this form. So there are three numbers you don't know, j, mu, and g, and as I said, one of these numbers is the units in which you measure velocity, so it doesn't really mean anything. J, then, you can think of as being related to how similar birds are to their neighbors, and G is how much variance there is. And the neighbors are near neighbors, so they are within a couple of meters of each other, although, in fact, what we do is to think about the nearest dozen or so birds. Um, and so you know that you're going to... Uh, so you're only constraining things um, that are within a couple of meters, but the flock is, is tens of meters across. So you can determine what these constants are just by matching the similarity to your neighbors and the variance of velocities. And then you have to ask yourself, is this model right? So can I predict something about the behavior of the flock that, um, that didn't go into building the model? And, um, ah, sorry, there's a very nice question here, um, which is, uh, which says, by using the maximum approach, we can find the probability distribution of these assumptions. How much information about the interactions themselves do we glean from the probability distribution? So, what in some, so we don't really, so, and, and then there's a question here about, um, uh, about dynamics. So let me emphasize again, this is a description of the probability distribution of the states of the flock at a single moment in time. We could have a whole discussion about the same, uh, asking the same question, not about correlations between uh, birds and their spatial neighbors, but also correlations between what the bird is doing at one moment in time and what it's doing at the next moment in time. And then you'd have a probability distribution not for the states of the flock, but for the sequences of states or the trajectories taken by the birds. 
which is a beautiful problem that people have worked on, but it's beyond the scope of what I wanted to talk about today. Um, let me also point out that, that um, uh, yeah, so somebody notices we are, um, we are talking about a flock of starlings, which are not particularly ordered, right? They're all flying in approximately the same, in approximately the same direction, but they're not spatially ordered like they would be in a flock of geese. And um, actually, I don't know whether people have done this analysis for uh, these kind of ordered flocks. Um, we've talked about dynamics. Um, if you consider higher moments, do things get better or worse? Let's hold that question for just a moment. Um, can we do this for people? Fantastic question beyond what I want to talk about today. Um, how do you go about gathering data from a flock from a practical standpoint? Great question. Um, so the way this was done is you climb up on top of a building and you mount multiple cameras so that you get a stereo view of, um, of right, you know, that, so the problem, of course, is that you want to reconstruct the positions in three dimensions. So in order to do that, you need more than one camera. Ideally, you would do it from different directions, but that's hard to do if the flock is out there in space. Um, so what you do is you take multiple cameras uh, all in a row and use in the same way that you can use your two eyes to reconstruct the depth of something, um, right? Your, your two eyes have slightly different views of the same object. And then that's one of the cues that you have to how far away something is. So you use that uh, same principle um, to, take, to take stereo, in fact, in fact, you use three cameras for technical reasons, not two um, images of the entire flock, and then you can reconstruct their positions in three dimensions. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, uh, analysis that goes into doing that, which is actually quite beautiful and interesting, um, which I don't have time to talk about right now. Um, I'm not going to talk about schools of fish, although people work on that. Um, uh, as I said, I'm going I'm to punt on the question of human behavior. We're assuming that all of the uh, group members are equal. Um, some evidence for that is provided by watching what happens when the, bird, when the flock turns. Turns can be initiated by almost any individual member. Um, there's no indication that there's a leader. Um, you could measure many different things. How do you know how many independent variables are sufficient? Um, that's sort of the same question as if I considered higher moments, would it help? So let me hang on for that for a moment. The model doesn't match well with height. Okay, so now let's, let, now let's look at the data. What, are, what, are, what graphs am I showing you? So this is Carlos's question. So um, in the data here, what we're doing is we're measuring how coral, so remember on average, all the birds are flying in the same direction at the same speed, otherwise it wouldn't be a flock. So we wanna look at the fluctuations. And so the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna decompose the velocities into a speed and a unit vector that points in a direction in the direction of their flight. And then we can compute the average of those unit vectors and compare the individual birds to that average. And we can ask if a bird that's over here happens to be you know, a few degrees to the left, what's happening with a bird that's on the other side of the flock? And we're gonna do that by taking all pairs of birds that are at a fixed distance from each other throughout the flock. And remember, there are thousands of these things, right? Um, and we're going to compute the average. And that's what you see here. These are these directional fluctuations. And because we've subtracted off the means in this way, it's positive at short distances, negative at long, long distances. I think the reason that you see deviations at these very longest distances is that, in fact, right, if you think about it, there aren't very many pairs of birds that are very, very far apart because they have to be at opposite ends of the flock. So although those few birds that those few pairs that happen to be at very large distances are quite similar to one another, which is why there's a small error bar here. You don't have very many of them. So it's not clear that you have a really good measurement of the, of, of the value of these correlations at long distances. So I would say that um, because the, um, the uh, behavior works all the way out to almost 30 meters, um, whereas your neighbors are only about two meters away, this is actually quite good agreement. And that's true both for um, the fluctuations in direction and for the fluctuations in speed. And there's another feature of these, these data which are quite surprising, which is that they're kind of featureless, right? There's no obvious scale in this problem. There, I mean, it's particularly true over here, right? What is the characteristic length over which things are correlated? Well, if you try to pick something, you might pick 
this point at which the function crosses zero. But then if you do that for many different flocks, what you discover is that that distance is just proportional to the size of the flock itself. So you might have thought that birds, since they only talk to their neighbors, that information would only propagate some distance throughout the flock. And as a result, there would be a scale on which the correlations fell to zero. And that turns out not to be true, that, that actually they propagate throughout the entire flock. And remember, this isn't a statement about the fact that they're on average, they're moving in the same direction. This is a statement about the fluctuations. And so let me actually finish um, uh, this idea and um, then I'll come back to the questions. And I think realistically, I'm not gonna be, get a chance to tell you very much um, about neurons. Um, I'll try to say a few words at the end. Um, so, um, uh, once again, ah, sorry. Um, let me uh, go back to sharing my screen. Sorry about that. Um, There we are, good. So what you saw was that, that, that the correlations really are almost featureless, right? There's no characteristic scale. So you might ask, well, what is it about the model that, that, that caused that to happen? So it turns out that for the fluctuations in direction, um, some of you will know that, that in statistical mechanics, there's a kind of deep reason for this, um, which I don't really have time to talk about. But in some ways, if you understand um, how, uh, how it is, for example, that all of the spins in a magnet decide to point in the same direction, then you understand why the directional fluctuations have these long range correlations. It's called Goldstone's theorem. So it's something that you can learn about. The situation for speed is much more surprising. So you'll remember there are basically two parameters in our description, one of which was J, which was related to how similar you are to your neighbors. And the other was G, which is, the variance of what the individual birds are doing around the mean. And so you can imagine reaching into the model and dialing the change in the, in changing the value of G. And as you do that, as you change the value of G, you change the variance of the velocity. So this intercept at zero of the fluctuations is the variance of the speed. And you can see that as you change the value of G, you always push this variance downward. And if you study the model at different values of G, you see that, for example, in here, right, there is a characteristic scale that, that the variance, so the short dist at very short distances, you see the variance, but then if you go to some characteristic distance, that has, fall that has fallen by a factor of two. And that distance that you need to go in order to fall by a factor of two changes as you, change the value of G. And that you also see it on the other side, right? That you don't see this, this sort of almost linear behavior of the correlations. And so what that means is that, um, that the, uh, there, somehow the value of G that, that fits the data is special. But it's important to emphasize that you don't fit these data with the value of G, the only thing you fit is the variance of the velocities. And so in fact, what's happening is that the variance of the velocities is essentially as large as it can be while still remaining correlated with your neighbor. And that's a very, if you think about the space of possible models, that is a very special place. And it corresponds in our understanding of equilibrium systems to a system which is poised exactly at its critical point in a phase diagram. So having arrived at a description of the system in terms of a small number of parameters, you can ask how does the, how, what, what is the set of possible systems that you can generate by varying these parameters? And as you know, right, from the example of ice and water, as you change parameters, you can change from one qualitative behavior to another, from a solid to a liquid, from a liquid to a gas, you know that there are phase boundaries, and you know that there are special places which are called critical points. 
And this kind of scale invariance emerges only at the critical point. So what I hope you've gotten out of this exercise with the flocks of birds is the idea that by trying to describe the flock, I've built a model which is in which I take a very small number of experimental facts about the system very seriously and try to match those perfectly. And then for other than that, I insist that the probability distribution have as little structure as possible. Despite the fact that I'm only taking a very small number of features of the data, I can predict all sorts of other features of the data and I get them right quantitatively as you see from matching this entire correlation function over an order, an order of magnitude in separation of the birds. And as you could see if you looked into the paper that, that I suggested you read, in fact, you can even compute correlations among groups of four birds instead of pairs of birds, and you get those right too. So these very simple models really do work. And so let me, um, let me now uh, go uh, and look back at the questions. Um, shouldn't the correlations decay to zero um, at far distances, high negative correlations in indicative of non-zero interactions? So uh, no. First of all, the way the correlation function has been defined, um, it can extend to large distances. It might or might not. That's an experimental question. The fact that you see non-zero correlations at very long distances is surprising. You're right about that. And you'll notice that we never introduced into the theory any long-range interactions. The only thing we did was match the short-range correlations. And so this is an example where the long-range correlations emerge as a consequence of the short-range interactions and the short-range correlations. That's what's special about the system. Okay, so you've put your finger on the thing which really is very surprising. Um, okay, we dealt with these questions. If you consider higher moments, well, the surprise here is that if you only keep track of the correlations between pairs, you actually do a very good job. And if you look in the paper that we gave you to read, you'll see that you can predict um, correlations among four birds, despite the fact that you only kept track you only insisted on matching the correlation between pairs of birds. So it might be that you need higher order things in order to get things right, but it seems like you don't. Um, does the bird physically detect the changes of velocity neighbors in order to avoid collision? So an important point about this description is that it's not mechanistic, right? I don't know how it is that the birds um, establish this probability distribution. I mean, we have ideas, of course, and in fact, if you look at a probability distribution that has this form, there's a very simple model you could write down in which what birds do is adjust their velocity to the average of their neighbors, but they do it in a noisy way. And so then what will happen is that they'll gradually look like they're, um, they'll look almost like a system in equilibrium, kind of doing Brownian motion on, the, on an energy surface. And that will generate a model that looks like this. But there's infinitely many different dynamical models that will generate the prob same probability distribution. And so you don't need to assume anything about that. Um, do turns initiate by a border individual have a higher tendency to generate global turning? So there are a couple of questions here about, um, about uh, the birds at the border. And to be completely clear, um, what, that, what we've done is in describing the probability distribution, we actually fix what the birds on the border are doing and describe the distribution in the interior of the, of the flock. Because as someone asked, um, uh, uh, the, um, the behavior of the birds on the border is different, right? They, they only have neighbors on one side. And so what you mean by neighbor then becomes complicated. And so to get ourselves out of that complication, we, we just take what happens on the border as given. And what that means is that if you want, we have a theory of the propagation of order throughout the flock, not the formation of it. Um, and uh, it is true that, that birds on the border tend to be the ones that, that initiate turns, uh, but not only, and actually the birds change their positions. Uh, does G refer to the acceleration due to gravity? No, uh, it's an unfortunate coincidence. And perhaps I should have chosen a different 
uh, language. Um, why does it have a distance which is uncorrelated? No interaction, even further you get high. Energy. So, um, so this is because it, it's slightly funny, right? Um, we have uh, defined the correlations as the difference between what an individual bird is doing and what the average of all the birds in the flock are doing. And so as a result, um, that's why this correlation can go negative. The other thing you could do is to think about comparing what an individual bird is doing to the average of what it does across time. And then in that case, the correlations would usually stay positive. Um, but there are technical reasons why um, it's attractive to always think about the difference between, between a single bird and the average over the flock, because you can define this in a single snapshot. Um, and again, it is really important to understand that correlations and interactions are different things. So remember that when you push on the block of ice, right, the motions of the atoms on opposite sides are correlated with each other as you push. But they're obviously not directly interacting with each other. Um, and so this fact that you can get long-range correlations from short-range interactions is a very fundamental fact about statistical mechanics. And it happens, but only at certain special settings of the parameters. Uh, uh, good, so that's done. Um, is it possible deviation of the edge birds being only one side? So I think I answered that one. Um, has optimal transport theory been used in such contexts? Not that I know of. What does negative correlation mean? It means that if one bird is going faster than the average, the other one tends to be going slower than the average, right? So that's what negative correlation means. Um, and let's see, there's some more down here. You can measure many variables. So right, we chose a particular set, and I hope you'll agree that in this case, it turned out the agreement with, you could predict from that set many other things, but sometimes you find that your predictions are not so good, and that means that there must be something that you're missing. Um, I think that what's happening at very large distances, there just aren't very many per pairs. Um, and, uh, um, and so that's why you see a deviation, but it's always possible that it's more subtle than that. Um, why is there, why are there different signs here? So here's a negative sign and here's a positive sign. Um, that's just so that the coefficient mu will also be positive because you want it to be the case that the average speed is positive. Um, and how can we do the different largest separation? We talked about that. Is there a risk of overfitting? There's always a risk of overfitting, but you'll notice that actually we only have two, um, we only have two numbers that we actually have to determine from the data. And so the risk of overfitting is incredibly small. And if you're worried about it, you can always take the data, divide it in half, learn the parameters from half of the data and predict the other half, and it works just as well. Um, if different microscopic laws result in the same emergent phenomena, do basic principles exist? Um, uh, so let me get to that one at the end. There's a question about higher moments. Um, the example I was thinking about with higher moments is higher moments of the directional fluctuations. And because when you talk about direction, you're talking about a unit vector, even if the probability distribution looks Gaussian, when you talk about the unit vectors, you spoil that because you're always insisting that the norm of the vector is equal to one. How do you experimentally, um, uh, uh, let's see. Okay, I wanna, I wanna do the, that one, let's see. Uh, with models, you mean the Vitchek model? So an, an example of a model that, that, um, that uh, a, a dynamical model that could generate these distributions is the Vitchek model. Um, when applying maximum entropy, Miguel, how are you? Um, this is either, this is a coincidence of one or two forms, either uh, two people have the same name or there's an unexpected person listening. Um, uh, with maximum entropy, you have to assume prior probability. I think that technically the problem here is that you, you kind of need a measure on the space that, that you're working in. And so uh, there are, there is a technical question there. So in order to say what you mean, um, with continuous variables in particular, you have to be careful about this. If we were talking about discrete variables, it wouldn't be so bad. I think that for the case of the birds, it's sort of natural to, 
use a kind of standard metric on, on the space of velocities, um, but you might worry about that. Uh, um, you can measure, uh, let's see. Uh, let's take only the open ones. Um, yeah, so it's done. Um, how do you experimentally measure the positions of velocities? I mentioned that. You do the, the stereo uh, thing. Uh, um, and uh, indeed, unfortunately, um, it seems that I did not plan as well as I should have. And so there will be not um, so much discussion about, there won't be any discussion about things in the brain. But I hope that, the, that um, at least this part about birds was understandable. Let me, um, let me do the following, um, which is to point out that um, I'll post the, we'll post these slides. Um, the work on, on flocks of birds actually happened uh, sort of in interchange with the work on populations of neurons. And when we started, we were thinking about populations of neurons in the retina. And as we got the first results on using these maximum entropy ideas to think about populations of neurons, I learned about the things that my colleagues in Rome were doing with flocks of birds. And this has gone back and forth now several times, where I think it's exciting that the same uh, general mathematical structure gets used in both cases. Um, so uh, I had hoped to say more, um, but I don't think that I have time to do that. Uh, um, there's this wonderful question about whether, given that there are, um, that many different microscopic laws result in the same emergent phenomena, are there really basic principles? I think that in many ways, the way in which we teach statistical mechanics hasn't caught up to our modern understanding that um, I think the elementary statistical mechanics courses that we teach in the physics curriculum, they, they sort of come as an appendix to, you know, they come after the quantum mechanics course, right? So you've learned that you can take matter apart and learn it's about its fundamental constituents and how the particles interact with each other and everything else. And then they say, well, statistical mechanics is how you build your way back to the behavior of matter that you can actually hold in your hand. And you're left with the impression somehow that the reason you get the behavior of macroscopic materials right when you try to predict it is because of your understanding of the microscopic structure and the fundamental interactions. I think that's actually not true. That, that indeed, as you point out, there are many different microscopic rules that can generate the same macroscopic behavior. And so what's fundamental or basic in that context is the, the way in which those finite set of possible macroscopic behaviors emerge from the different microscopic theories. And the fact that the mapping is many to one doesn't mean that it isn't interesting to know what really happens at a microscopic scale, but it does mean that what happens at a macroscopic scale is somewhat independent. And so the, in, in that sense, what happens at the macroscopic scale is as fundamental as what happens at the microscopic. In the present context, um, where we're talking about the flocks of birds, you'll also notice that the parameters, the, the thing that's happening at the macroscopic scale is actually quite special. You have these long range correlations that arise because the parameters of the system have been tuned to be close to a critical point. And that presumably arises from the microscopic level, what the individual birds are doing in a way that we don't yet understand. And so this issue of, of you know, what's microscopic, what's macroscopic, what's fundamental, what's, what's derived, um, is much more subtle, I think, in our modern understanding. Um, so I did not have a chance to talk about the, the second paper that, that I suggested that, um, that, that you look at. Um, if you read carefully in that paper, and there is also um, a, a second longer paper, which is cited um, in, in the slides that, that, that I'm not showing because I don't have time, um, the fact that, uh, that those cells have very particular properties. So in the same way that you might ask yourself about the birds, do individual birds in the flock have some special role? And is that, is that important in calculating the properties of the flock as a whole? You might also ask in a population of neurons, 
is what individual neurons are doing important? And of course, at some level it is, but does, does some particular fact about what the individual neurons are doing, and the question here is referring to um, uh, so-called grid cells, um, in fact, those experiments were, the experiments that, that um, are in the paper that I gave you to read um, are in the hippocampus, so they're clay cells rather than grid cells. Um, that fact is presumably important because that's something the animal cares about, but that fact will not allow you to explain the behavior that we saw. So if you make a model that reproduces the place cell behavior, it does not automatically generate the kind of behavior that we see when we go through coarse graining and scaling. And so, um, so the answer is, of course it's important, but it's not an explanation. I hope that, I hope that helps. Um, and so that's all the questions. So um, I want to apologize for overestimating how much I could say in the space of an hour, uh, but I hope that um, the things that I did say are, were comprehensible. Um, and we will post all of the slides, um, uh, even the ones that I didn't show and, and the notes that, that I wrote. Um, and you're welcome to, uh, I mean, since you've read the, the, the other paper, I gather that also in the discussion this more earlier this morning, um, there was much more focus on, on one paper rather than the other. Uh, so maybe uh, the lecture sort of echoes that. Um, if you would like to learn more, um, you should feel free to send questions. Um, I gather there's, you know, in the same place where, where you could put questions before the lecture, you could still put questions there after the lecture, just draw a line and, and um, we'll come back and, uh, and write written answers, which we can post um, also to the course website. So it's 1.15. Uh, if everybody's okay with um, not too many, I'm not seeing uh, new questions. So maybe let me say thank you. And um, you will, you'll be back next week uh, for something different. Aha. Uh -huh. And um, thank you for your attention. So, Mana, Rima, do you want to uh, close things off or? Yes, I will close things off. Thank you, everyone. Good. Thank you. <laughs>